Hey everybody, it's Mike Badger. I'm back with another Dresden Files review, book four, Summer Night. This one is going to be a spoiler review. We're not doing spoiler free. I tried it, and it just takes too much time. Try to pack in most of my thoughts in the first few minutes that are spoiler light, we'll say, and then I'll go into a deeper dive as it goes on towards the end. All right, so let's kick off first. Harry Dresden doesn't know how to do things small. After kicking off an interdimensional war, He's got the White Council Wizards, the Red Court of Vampires. That right after that, Harry decides, I'm going to propose to the woman I love, who is in a weird vampire life crisis. He's going to get rejected, blame himself for all of it, of course, all the way through to not keeping himself in shape, staying up way too late, trying to find a solution, trying to make amends for something that is, for him, the end of the road. Within a couple of chapters of Summer Night, Harry finds himself nearly assassinated. He's beholden to the Queen of Fairies, one of the Queens of the Fairies. He's told he has to find out who is precipitating a potential climate change crisis in the world. And he has to do all of this while he's a wreck. Let's just throw into that mix Harry's long lost ex, because why not? And she is the opposing Harry. So the people who are not Harry's friends in this situation, she's going to help him out because that's just going to be great, great tension. Fantastic. This is a typical day in Dresden land and we have to struggle through Harry's self-doubts, and yet at the end of the day, it's pushing Butcher's writing forward. It's going from oh, overall pretty good to consistently solid with a strong story that lets us dive into the fairy court. So book one, we had the evil wizard. Book two, we had the werewolves. Book three, we have the ghosts. And now we're gonna meet the fairy courts in more depth. The novel centers around these courts and it's really about getting finger on the pulse of what fairy means in the Dresden Files. It's the first major time we meet the players. So the players are you have a night for each court, a summer night and a winter night. Summer night, I wonder when, is that relevant? I don't know, I don't know. Summer night is in trouble and Harry's gotta figure out what's going on. And to do that, we got three queens on each side who are all potentially suspect in this whole thing because if it's winter and summer coming head to head, inevitably the people in charge have something to do with this. And you have the queen who was the mother, you have the queen who is, who's the actual queen, and then you have the daughter, and those three on each side. So you have six, six major players. And it turns out having multiple queens is interesting family dynamics. And so Butcher knows that he's bringing us into very unfamiliar ground with a lot of moving pieces. And one thing he's really good at is following Mark Twain's advice, as I've heard him quote in interviews. I'm paraphrasing it poorly, but the idea is to add two familiar world elements for each fantastical element. So since his is urban fantasy, the series as a whole, Butcher needs to make sure he brings two, not one, two grounding elements in the real world in order to introduce new fantastical elements. So we have a lot of the players we're comfortable with, a lot of the real world struggles that Harry's going through that we all get in terms of you lose a, you lose a lover, you are potentially guilty for lots of people getting in trouble, lots of people getting hurt for something, beat yourself up, you push away your friends. All these things are grounding real world issues and you need to have that many because you're gonna introduce a swath of new things that are completely, let's just say it's a mess, a little bit of a mess. We have Murphy coming back. I really enjoy Butcher's development of Murphy overall. Her dynamic with Harry is moving past this whole dark, I can never trust you because you broke that one thing you said to me one time. All those frustrations and their dynamic of, of Harry and Murphy not getting along, not working, that's starting to move away because we're introducing, they have a lot of shared experience, a lot of shared motives and values, and they're really starting to click as people. And what I like is that Butcher is not setting up an obvious romance here. It's not like, oh, I need to have Harry with a love interest and Susan's in trouble, so I'm just going to put Murphy there. Not at all, which is fantastic because that makes Murphy able to stand on her own legs. And that's the entire drive that he's been moving over the last few books towards is getting Murphy to be independent of Harry, being able to handle herself, know what's going on and start to get a handle on everything. So that's really great that he very early on in the book. And as the book goes on, he's really starting to feed that into making Murphy even more awesome. The Murphy-Harry dynamic starts to gel. Butcher is not one to turn away from emotional, psychological trauma scarring. That's one thing I really appreciate about him is it's very rare for a character to go through something and then not come back around to it, have to work through the issues that resolve from that event. It's not like, oh, that thing happened six months ago. I'm just going to forget about it. Who cares? Now, Murphy's still going through issues from the first three books, let alone what's going to go on in the future. And she's real. She feels like a real character now, not just a caricature. Fantastic. 
I was also really like that Harry's working through this attitude. It's He needs it for the story and it works, but by the end of the story, we're able to move a bit away from this and Harry can start to break the shell and learn from his struggles and experiences rather than just be sunk in them forever. I like that a lot. Literal raining frogs at the very first page or two of the book. You know there's going to be some serious issues to work through. It works a lot. And that's because Butcher's humor is on point. Uh, one of the things I didn't like about Full Moon was that the humor did not land. It really didn't. It was not that funny. There were some jokes here or there, but very few and it's super dark. I think Butcher's realized he's needs to move away this hyper serious noir and really keep the cartoony comical elements in play. And Summer Night's where you can start to feel a comfort there. There's a balancing mix that works. There's some action scenes now that go, in the past they've been intense, but now they're going to the absurd like they're ridiculous. Like you have to laugh out loud how over the top it is. There's one mini boss fight in the middle that really stands out. And even at the end, the battlescape where things are laid, just it's crazy. It's brilliant how absurd it is. And yet you feel like you're there. It's excellent. And so while it's entertaining, there are some inconsistencies I'm noticing. I don't know if it's just Butcher evolving the world and realizing certain things they put into play are not quite as important or maybe not as consistently needed. One thing was there's a major emphasis placed on the accords and the way that the supernatural and mortal world connect. If you get the Fae to tell you something directly, the whole idea is that they can't lie to you. I mean, they might twist and manipulate things, but they can't directly lie to you. And yet Harry, he says, oh, well, they, you know, they can circumvent that by, you know, giving you food or giving you gifts or manipulating you in ways. And then he proceeds to break his own rules. I don't care for that. The whole, like, I'm the expert and you're not. So I know when to break the rules and you don't. So I'm just going to break them. Even though I just told you like five minutes ago, don't do this thing because it's stupid. I'm just going to do it anyway. That sort of thing happens a few times and I'm not a fan of it. I don't recall it being a consistent issue throughout the series. So it might just be it's an issue in this book and doesn't persist. But I, I was frustrated with that. In the attempt to be super clever, and yet the book itself is pretty much the same length as the prior books, to try to be super clever, weave a massive amount of inf supernatural information, reintroduce old characters, have new characters, and have this major, major strain on Harry to juggle all these things. Butcher spent a little bit too much time with characters like Meryl, for example, who is introduced in the book, and is not really a payoff character. I, I see why he was trying to do but I don't think it works. I don't think it lands. And I think as the series goes on, as he gives himself a little more room to breathe in the books and also his writing gets better, he starts to separate and to define which characters, like if a character is there, it's gonna have, it's gonna matter a lot more later on. And in this book is the first time of the first four at least where I'm like, eh, I don't see that because of how short-lived at least one of the characters, this character Meryl was. Not such a fan of how much time was spent with her. I understand why, but it didn't quite land for me. Butcher is, has a cadence, he's comfortable, you can see the steady improvement, the writing improvement, the, the dialogue improvement, pretty much everything's improved, and I think will continue to improve. So despite my reservations on a few elements of this book, at the end of the day, he's in development mode and pushing hard. So we got evil wizards, werewolves, ghosts, fairies. What's gonna come next? Death Mass. So we'll talk about that next time. And now I'll go a bit into if you if you just wanted a spoiler light overview of it, like that's this is where it's ending. And if you want to pick up some of the in-depth thoughts I have, then let's continue. So there are a number of things throughout the book that stood out to me as gonna matter later on or are matter within the book that I thought were really cool. First was that who is Mab? Mab is the monarch of the of the she. She's the the queen of the winter court. And she's described as rich, suggestive, cultured. Harry doesn't quite know where her English is from. It sounds European. And so I think that's going to matter later on because we learn that the Fae are the closest to the mortal world. And most of the Fae, pretty much all the Fae, I think, are given a choice in their lives to be either immortal or mortal. And that's a big part. And also which court they're serving. A lot of the wild Fae, the general Fae population, don't serve either court. And they kind of get pulled in either direction. So that's a question of like, where is Mab from? And what's that background? I'm sure it's going to be important later. Then we have a great line from Mab where she says, I adore freedom. Anyone who doesn't have it wants it. And that just sums up, I think, her whole character. Like that's that's the pulse that she's playing on with mortals. That's her that's her card. That's she has that on a card. That's her slogan. It's like Mab, adore of freedom, because anyone who doesn't have it wants it. And she's the monarch, so it, it's just brilliant. Harry meeting with the senior council. 
where he's getting strung up for the, for the whole red court thing. It's it's just shoved in there. It doesn't have such a major impact outside of Harry's gotta gotta figure out how to get them off his back. That it's not that the red court was a problem anyway, and it's not just all about him. But there's some stuff about Harry between the senior council that's talked about where like Martha Liberty, she says to Ebenezer, she says, you know who he was meant to be. And what does that mean? What does that mean? Who was Harry meant to be? And what does that mean for him going like someone designing him with someone having an influence in his life? We know his mother was setting a bunch of things up. So I wonder where that's going to go. Uh, and she talks about how there was a whole disaster about Simon Petrovich, who was a senior council member and supposedly he was killed. And he was Justin DeMorne's mentor and Justin DeMorne was Harry's mentor. So there's a whole line of reasoning about it that Harry is involved and yada yada i'm not going to get into that because i don't think it matters that much this early in the series anyway i'm just pointing out that there's a whole discussion here that's probably important for later we introduced peabody who from what i remember shows up again later in the series with a more important role i just thought it was interesting that oh yeah it's a name drop name drop peabody there and it goes to show butcher's plan this whole thing he's dropping hints right and left and peabody was right here in book four then what I really liked, as I said before, Harry realizing that Murphy is struggling. She's struggling with her job. She's to keep her job down. She's struggling with the psychological backlash she's had from the last few books. And Harry realizes that she's a big girl and can stand up and hold her own. And he needs to be there as her support, not as her protector. And I really like that. I think that that moves their relationship into peer respect development is happening especially because he introduces elaine who's harry's ex and he grew up with her learned magic together first lover is a complicated woman in the whole thing of the whole span of things but in this case with murphy it's like mm, that's a really cool connection we also have grimalkin show up grimalkin is the cheshire cat reminds you of wizard of oz well grimalkin is in winter not a nice guy at all not the first time or the last time i'm sure we're gonna see him because again Butcher seeds things, and Grimalkin, I remember, shows up again at some point. We also have a pretty important scene with Aurora, who's the daughter. She's the summer daughter. Has a conversation with Harry where she looks into his soul, so to speak. Not through her soul gaze, but she looks at him and it's like, I, I see your pain and suffering, and from the beginning, you were meant to be a destroyer, a killer. Now, this could be a psychological mess as she's just trying to manipulate him and make him feel even more guilty about what's been going on in the story so far. But I don't know, this is, there's a lot of emphasis on Harry being something, something planned, a problem for people. At the beginning of the book with the senior council, with Aurora in the middle, there's clearly a lot of setup around Harry being more than he appears to be. Which I don't necessarily love, I don't love the chosen one, I hate that kind of trope. I don't think it's going to come out that simple, but I do think that there's a lot more to Harry's, Harry's trajectory than meets the eye, than even Harry knows about. We also have... It, where Aurora touches him in that same scene, Aurora touches him and it makes him feel like weak and vulnerable as if he's passing time, as if time goes by. It's really weird. It makes it seem like she did something to him, but we don't know what exactly she did. And given that she's revealed later in the book to be kind of crazy and messed up and something's wrong with her, this scene stuck out to me as strange. I, I don't know what exactly it means. I don't know how much she can manipulate him without his consent, given she's Fae. And yeah, she can trick him into something, but can she actually act on him in this way? Seemed a little odd. I don't know where that's going to go, but I wanted to note it. And then Harry says that I'm not dying this time. And his godmother says, well, that's a matter of opinion, child, that you're in grave danger. We know that Harry's always in danger. What is she speaking about? It can't just be a typical danger. Something is a big foot. Then we have Leah do some foreshadowing around never let Mab bring you to the stone table. And from what I remember, that comes up later on in the series. So I'm sure that's going to come circle around again. And then at the end of the book, we have Elaine show that she has a bunch of magic foci, foci, focuses. I did never study Latin. So like Harry, I have no idea, but she has multiple magic focus items. They're clearly labeled and listed to what they are, but we don't know how they work or what they do. And I'm always interested in this stuff because we know Harry's pentacle does certain things. We know Harry's blasting rod and his staff and each of the things he has does something different. But each wizard has a different way of focusing and using their magic. And so I'm interested to know what Elaine's are, especially because she appears to have a matching pentacle, which is also a little bit odd because if Harry got his pentacle from his mother, then where did Elaine get her pentacle from? Lots of questions, not a lot of answers, but I thought overall, as I said, Summer Night was pretty solid. It was good. 
with lots of great seating within it. Definitely hammer home the quartz. Book five takes a step away from the fairies for a little bit and I'm looking forward to talking about death masks next. So what did you guys think about Summer Night when you read it? Uh, so if you've read it, if you're a first-time reader, if you haven't read it before, what do you think about some of my speculation thoughts about the book? What do you think about the book as a whole? If you're interested in this kind of stuff and you want to know more of Dresden stuff, lore-wise, reading-wise, the books themselves, reviews, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more. As always, Mike Badger signing out. I'll see you at the next one.